And the post-truth era is going to be divided into three main sections that we're going to talk about. The first is what the post-truth era actually is. Then we're going to ask the question, what is truth? And then finally, we're going to try and tie it together by working out whether it all matters or not. So the first topic is the post-truth era itself. And the question obviously arises, what does post-truth mean? Uh, it's probably not a term that you've used that much yourself. But the interesting thing is that the uh, Oxford Dictionaries Company uh, each year goes and has a look at the words that are most frequently in vogue at any particular time. And this year they plowed through a whole range of words as they normally do, and they chose the word, or the, the combined words, post-truth, as the word of the year for the Oxford Dictionaries. So out of all the lists of, that were submitted and, and based on their research and analytical research, they found that this word post-truth was being used more and more frequently. And in many ways, what they try and do when they choose this word is choose a word which defines the times and defines the zeitgeist, the feeling, the thinking of the age. So the word that they chose was, in their terms, post-truth. And they defined it as that which relates to or denotes circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. What that means in simple English is that you can put facts in front of people, but if you say things which are lies or the opposite of the facts, but you say them with enough conviction and emotion and appeal, people will believe the latter rather than the facts. It's a remarkable indictment of the age that they said that this is a definition of what they think common thinking is. Now, this, this word is actually quite an old word, but was really brought to the fore in a remarkably prescient book written by um, a journalist by the name of Ralph Keyes. And he published a book in 2004 called The Post-Truth Era, from which we derive our title. It's a very interesting book to read. You can, you can get it on Amazon, download it as a Kindle book to read. And, and his main premise in the book is that dishonesty and white lies are so prevalent in daily society that it's influenced the very nature of the way that people think and act and behave with one another. But he didn't really even touch on the, the final outcome of where this has ended, and it's ended in the movement of personal mistruths or untruths into the public arena, where things can be publicly verified and checked. So from 2004 to 2016, the use of the word post-truth was relatively unheard of. But then something happened in 2016, and it was a double event. It was the events of Brexit, and the U.S. presidential election. And those two combined factors caused a massive spike in the use of the, word, the words post-truth. In fact, the Oxford Dictionaries Company says that it, they noted a 2,000% increase in the use of the words post-truth to describe the era in which we live. So as a, a word which describes our age, it's probably very appropriate. So let's look at, at two of those to start with. Let's look at the Brexit post-truth for a moment. Well, we know Brexit, obviously, is the, the vote that took place in the United Kingdom to separate the UK from the rest of the European Union and all that entailed, all the agreements and the bilateral trade um, agreements and all the other structuring that has taken place between the UK and the EU. Now, one of the main protagonists in this was the ex-mayor of London, Boris Johnson, who is quite an erudite speaker. He, he gets people on side. He's got a huge personality with his tussled hair, and when he speaks, people just listen. He's got that type of persona about him. And he was on the side of leave, i.e. get out of the EU. 
And he started a, a very public campaign and started sprouting out stuff which, as the New Statesman uh, Journal uh, publishes, they were utter lies, or many of the things he said were utter lies and fabrications. And he was tag-teamed by Nigel Farage from the UKIP party, um, who in this interview with the Observer magazine was quoted as saying, I don't listen to music, watch TV or read. And the last is the most worrying of, of all of them. Because, you see, unfortunately, Nigel Farage caught on to the zeitgeist and the spirit of the age in Britain, which was, let's bash the establishment. And between them, they put forward a story which was plausible and believable by many people. And the end result, of course, was that there was a huge fight between those who wanted to stay in blue in the background and those who wanted to leave. And, and we know that leave won. Of course, in the front, they, they are saying themselves, don't swallow Dave's, that's David Cameron, the Prime Minister's pork pies. Now, for those of you who don't know British slang, that's Cockney slang for lies. It's Cockney rhyming slang. So don't swallow David Cameron's lies, his porky pies. So what they were trying to say is David Cameron is lying. Everybody was accusing everybody else of lying, but was telling a bunch of mistruths themselves. A, a great example of it was this bus that was decked out and toured the UK during Brexit, um, telling everybody that £350 million a week leaves the shores of the UK and goes to the European Union. What they failed to actually say is how much came back in terms of European grants and offsets. So it was a half-truth, a, a, a fake statement, but it had its net effect. A lot of people said, well, let's use that to fund the NHS instead. And just after Brexit was announced, Nigel Farage publicly said, yes, we knew that was nonsense, but it worked. So you see, people don't mind saying untruths if it achieves the objectives. And people can see factually that's not true, but they go along with a lie because it suits them. So this is what is meant by the post-truth age. What about the U.S. presidential election? Well, the U.S. presidential election probably had two of the most unpopular candidates uh, of recent history pitted against each other. Both of them, Hillary Clinton was probably the most capable of the two as, as, a, as a politician, but was deeply disliked and distrusted particularly because she stood for what the establishment was. You know, everything that Washington and the old uh, hierarchical order of, of American uh, politics stood for. In fact, in Washington State, she won 97% of the vote. Not Washington State, in Washington, D.C., she won 97% of the vote, which tells you the establishment was strongly behind Hillary Clinton. But she was deeply disliked and had a whole litany of issues that were surrounding her, including deleting emails and a whole lot of other things. Then you, you've got Donald Trump, who of course was very popular, said all the things people wanted to believe, but hasn't had one ounce of governmental experience at all. He's, he's become a businessman, bankrupted himself many times and uh, rehabilitated himself. But, you know, these were the two choices that were presented to the American voter. Now, it's very interesting that there's uh, a group of websites that go and check on the statements of politicians. In fact, there's one Africa fact check that checks on what goes on in Africa. The Americans have got a bunch of them. This is just one of them. It's called PolitiFact. And what they do is they rank the utterances of the, the um, politicians, and they say how many of them are true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, or liar, liar, pants on fire, the, the most extreme of all lies. So if you have a look at On Balance, Hillary Clinton mostly spoke stuff that was pretty factually true, maybe with a bit of bias and, and taint, but she was pretty much, you know, on, on the side of, of truer than more false. When you look at Donald Trump, the, the figures are completely different. And it's remarkable to see how many of them are plainly, 
utterly false or egregiously false. I mean, just totally ridiculous that they couldn't ever be true. But yet, whenever he seems to open his mouth, out pour lies. And it's, it's so much, it's so prevalent that he will say what he knows the audience is expecting. Whether it ruffles feathers or not, he'll just say what they want for the outcome. And as we know, he won the election. Based on, as one website has it, 1,432 lies since June this year. It depends how you measure it. but you know, Whatever it is, it's a large number of lies. And here's an example. So, the BBC ran a story just this last week that um, Donald Trump claimed that millions um, who were illegally in the US voted against him in the presidential poll. And he won, and if you had stripped out those votes, he would have won the popular vote. In other words, the majority by normal, by normal count. And that's his claim. If you asked many of his supporters, they would say that's absolutely true because Donald Trump said it. Well, it didn't take very long till the White House came out with real numbers and real facts and said, this is just absolutely nonsense. It can't be the facts. And with real numbers and real facts, they disproved him. But it didn't matter. He's made his point, and everybody believes that a whole lot of illegal votes were cast. Finished. And you know, you might think this is all just very funny, but there was an excellent article in the Guardian uh, newspaper in the UK uh, which uh, the, the, the author Jonathan Friedland went in, into pains to show that post-truth politicians such as Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are absolutely no joke. They're incredibly dangerous people. And the article goes in, into some deep analysis on that. But what both of them have done is they've tapped into the spirit of the age which is anti-establishment. In other words, it's, we don't care what exists. Let's tear down the walls. And you can see the spirit of the age pervading pretty much everywhere, even to such tiny little places as Iceland. In Iceland, the Pirate Party, I'm not joking, the Pirate Party with skull and crossbones, the Grr Pirate Party, has been asked to form the new government. Can you believe it? They are anti-establishment, their whole um, uh, demeanor and aspect is, is completely against whatever went before. And the Pirate Party is now going to be the governing authority in Iceland because people want to tear down what existed before. It's not just limited to politics. If any of you have been looking online, you would have seen that there's been a big issue recently about Facebook and other online issues with news. There was an article again in the BBC on, on the Facebook um, issue with fake news and the meaning of truth. So it's very interesting, this whole issue of discussion of what's real and what's, what's not, what's post-truth and what's true and false, is being publicly debated. So much so that Mark Zuckerberg went and got a whole lot of his people and they had what's known as a hackathon where... They got people to try and work out how they can filter out the fake news because Facebook is pervaded with such rubbish. So many false stories of cures and Jacob Zuma resigning and you can't, and the Queen backing Brexit and all this nonsense is proliferating all over Facebook. But they can't filter it out quick enough or work out ways of doing it. And you think, well, it's just maybe ordinary people like you and I get duped. Well, Barack Obama was, was caught many times actually praising some news sources which are patently fake news sources. But he had used them as a reference and unfortunately was praising them for the quality of their news output and has been caught doing so just because it's so hard to tell truth from lies. Well, finally, another crazy one off News 24 in South Africa. This lady found truth in a teapot. Now she's sharing a special blend with you. So you see, this issue of truth is a malleable thing in today's world. You know, when many of us who are older would, would grow up in a world where people said, you tell the truth. 
And truth was not a malleable concept. It's either true or it's not true. They were logically opposite. But not in today's world. So we've got to ask ourselves the question then, what is truth? What is truth? Now the lovely thing is when you look at the Old Testament, the word truth has its basis in that which is steadfast, that which is solid, that which is dependable, and that which is reliable. Something solid that you can, you know is true. Something you can grip onto. Something rock-like that you can place your trust on. Not something variable and changeable. That's the Old Testament definition of truth. And you can look it up in your own time or we can, we can help you do that. The biggest issue in our age, and, and some of it is partly philosophical, is that this whole concept of one truth has been replaced with many truths. Now, you can sometimes see why. So, for example, if, if you had a, a, a cardboard carton of milk and you had only ever seen the bottom of the carton in your whole life, you could say that carton was square because you'd only ever seen the bottom. If you had only ever been exposed to the side of it, you would say it was basically rectangular. Both of them would be true in their own perspective, but not in the perspective of the whole. They would be true in a limited sense. And that's the biggest danger of our age. Because people say, it's true for me in my worldview, it must be true generally. The truth of that milk carton is it is a complex shape. You may have true views of it, but it's the truth of the milk carton is defined by its sum of its, all its parts and all its views. And we tend to view our little worldview as being true. Whereas we know from the scriptural point of view, scripture presents one truth. It doesn't mean we have that one truth. It means there is one truth which we are aspiring to. And we have to see it in all its facets to understand what one truth truly is. Now this question of what truth is was posed 2,000 years ago by an important man. It was a man who was very powerful in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was the man Pontius Pilate who was the governor of Judea under the, uh, the rulership of Tiberius Caesar. And what Pontius Pilate did is he posed this question to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to look for truth, here's one of the most powerful people in that time asking the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you think the answer is going to be? The answer is in John 18, verses 37 to 38. Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Not to truths or variants, to the truth. I am bearing witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So here's a very, very interesting um, lesson that's getting taught to us. There is a truth, and you want to know about it, you have to listen to Jesus. That's what he's saying. What do you think Pilate did when he heard that? He says to him, what is truth? And people have debated whether that was sneering or what it was. But whatever it was, did you notice what Pilate did next? He didn't wait for the answer. Pilate asks the question and didn't wait for the answer. When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. He didn't wait for the answer, but the answer was standing right in front of his face. Truth was found in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had every opportunity then to avail himself of it. He didn't. And it slipped him by. So Jesus said he was bearing witness to the truth. 
What was that truth that Jesus was bearing witness to? What could it have been? Well, the lovely thing is if you go back in the Bible, the Bible is always full of resonances. And you just go back to a wonderful passage in the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. And here comes the clue in verses 3 to 4. Moses told the people, Proclaim the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God. Now look at the attributes that he gives to God. He is the rock, the stability, the fortitude, the thing which can be trusted. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. There's no flavor of truth with God. He is a God of truth. Isn't that wonderful? The very attribute of truth is named as an attribute of God. You want the source of truth, you have to find out what God thinks. And with him, there's no injustice. Righteous and upright is he. And that's a wonderful catalogue of these great qualities of the God that we love and worship. So how was Jesus bearing witness to this? Well, he tells us in John 14. Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Not literally, obviously, because no man can see God and live. But he who has seen me has seen the Father. In the sense that they said, Show us the Father. He says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Why? Because Jesus took that catalogue of principles and made them his. Perfectly, he took every single one of those qualities and they became Jesus' personal qualities. Not just in word, but in action. He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority. In other words, I am attributing what God has taught to my words. But the Father who dwells in me, he's the one who does the works. I and my Father are one. And he goes on later to say that we must be one with Jesus. In the same way, unified in thought and practice and principle. So now you can understand, my dear friends, when Jesus says to the people, I am the way, the path you must choose. I am the truth, God's truth, personally shown in the face of Jesus Christ. And the end result of following me on that way is the life. This is truth which doesn't lead to worries and problems. This is truth which leads to light and to life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So how do you and I follow this way, truth, and life? You know, it's a principle that Jesus is stating, but you and I want to do something about it, surely. So Jesus gives us the clue. He said... If you abide, this is in John 8, 31 to 32, if you abide in my word. Now remember what words he was speaking, what words were they? They were the words of his father. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, truly, absolutely. And you shall know the truth. Isn't that wonderful? Instead of your, all your versions of truth, what you think life is, when you follow me, you will see everything from the complete picture, which is God's picture. You'll see the purpose of life. You'll see things from a bigger perspective. You will see the truth, all-encompassing. And you and I can think this life in Christ is constrained. Jesus says this truth is liberating. This truth makes you free. And think about it in the terms of the context of the things we were talking about before. All of those other untruths and lies are based on human-driven desires, bigotry, lying, cheating, for purpose. When you live a life in Christ, you are freed from all of those things. You are seeing life as it really should be. Truth becomes real to you. You are seeing it from the divine perspective. This is what Jesus is saying. Let my words live in you. And when those words live in us, do you think truth becomes malleable? Or do you think we have something permanent in which to anchor ourselves? 
Well, again, the words of the Master teach us what we really should trust in. Because he says in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 25, Whoever hears these sayings of mine, and not only hears them, but does them, puts them into practice, not head knowledge, real practice, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What rock do you think that could be, except the God of truth? You see, if we are basing our lives on the God of truth, as witnessed in the face of Jesus Christ, we have something absolutely stable to believe in. We can have comfort in something which doesn't change. As that man could stand at the door of that lighthouse, despite everything going around him with confidence in the engineering and the rock on which that lighthouse was built, we can so do in the turmoils of our lives if we have Christ and God as our anchor. What this does mean, though, is that post-truth behavior should be incompatible with those who proclaim to be disciples of Christ. So if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, do you think that you can talk like the politicians do, or people in business, and manipulate the truth for, for gain? Do you think you can do that? Well, have a look at what God says in Proverbs 6 through the wise man. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. These six things the Lord hates, not mildly dislikes or disapproves of. The Lord hates these things. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and anyone who sows discord among brethren. Remarkable that out of seven attributes that God hates, two of them are about lying. See, he is a God of truth, and he can't deny himself in tolerating these principles, if he is truly a God of truth. So you and I need to look at these, this list very carefully, because these are things that God finds absolutely repulsive, and we can't do it in any shape or form in our lives. That's why you can see true discipleship is out of kilter with the thinking of the post-truth era. You know, just, just bend the truth a bit, you know. Just say that that tender will go in on time and we know it can't because we'll get an extension and get more money. Just bend the truth. People do it all the time. Not so for the disciples of Christ. And why is this? Because when you do that, you are actually sitting in two minds. You've got the mind that knows what's right and you've got the mind which is saying, let's just bend the truth a little. James says, if you like that, you're like a person with two heads. You're double-minded. And because of that, you're unstable in your own head. Because half of you is your conscience pricking you, the other half is your human desire to do what it wants. And you're fighting all the time between these two thinkings. James says that's double-minded. And you will be unstable. Not built on a rock, you'll be unstable. In fact, there was a time when Israel was under great pressure in the times of Elijah. And Elijah, in telling them to choose between the prophet, the, uh, between following God and the false god Baal, says to them, How long will you falter between two opinions? The word in the Hebrew is actually like a little sparrow hopping. That's the word that's used. Are you going to hop, 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 hop? Between different opinions, follow God, follow the world, follow God, follow God, follow the world, follow God. Bouncing between the two like a little hopping sparrow. Elijah said, if Yahweh is God, make up your mind and simply follow him. Stop prevaricating. Choose your one path and stick to the truth. That's what Elijah was advocating. So this means change is required to follow the truth. 
We can't carry on living like people in the world and people who go about doing their own thing. We have to change to fit our way of thinking to the thinking of God. Ephesians tells us in Ephesians 4 verse 25, we have to put away lying. They're not white lies. They're not things which are convenient for the moment. You've got to put away lying. Let each one speak, each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. It has to be on the basis of truth. Even, and you know what? Truth most often hurts more than lies. Lies can be used to soothe things, make everything feel better. It's very often truth that hurts. But you know, it's like a person who's got a dread disease. Would you rather say it's, it's okay and then they die? Or would you say, listen, you've got a bad problem. Let's start dealing with it. The truth hurts. That's the only path to recovery. And so it is with us morally. We have to follow this in our lives. So then living the truth based on those scriptures there means that we've got to do three things. Not only is the truth got to be recognized, but we have to obey it. Obeying means it commands and we listen. That's what obedience means. It's telling us how we live and we don't debate it. We just do it. You, my disciples, if you do the things which I command you. They weren't good suggestions from Jesus. They were commandments from Jesus. Do you obey? And if you do then, how does this manifest in the way you speak to people and speak to one another? Is it full of truth or has it still got sides and angles to it because of your own needs or the needs of those around you? And then finally, once this truth has truly liberated you and made you free, you know, a person who follows the truth doesn't have to have much of a memory, do you? Because if you fabricate a whole lot of lies, you've got to remember all the lies you tell everybody. But if you follow the truth, you can live a mind with a very clear conscience. You don't have to remember what you said to one person or another. You just live a truthful life. And in that, we are liberated and we are free in Christ and we rejoice in the truth in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this mean then? Colossians says in three, Colossians 3 verses 9 to 11 that we're not to lie to one another. Why? Because when we take on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, we put off an old character. The old man is effectively dead with all the things that the old world entailed, the previous life. And it's as if we put on a new man, a new covering in Christ, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So we are renewed when we stop lying to one another. It's, you can't lie to one another and have renewal. And the end result of this is it doesn't matter where we're from, Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarians, so the enslaved or free, but Christ is all and in all. And these are people who have taken on the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ in Christadelphian communities around the world. In Africa, in the Caribbean in the middle, in India on the side, and just this last week in the United Kingdom. These are people who have decided to do that because they have decided that there is a truth worth following in today's world. So then finally then, why does this matter? Why should it matter, apart from all the good reasons we've given you? Well, there's another reason. There's a reason given to us in Psalm 96, verse 13, which says, He, that is God, is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. What do you think he's going to judge the earth on? He's going to judge the world with righteousness. It's one of his attributes. But he's going to reimpose on the people his truth. Isn't that interesting? The psalmist says that the post-truth era isn't going to last for long. When God comes to settle the issues on this earth, it's going to be settled through truth. 
And truth will prevail. And it's his truth which is inviolate and not based on opinion. How is, the Lord, how is this going to happen? How is the Lord going to bring this to pass? Well, he tells us. He's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, the same language as Psalm 96, by the man whom he has ordained. The Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect representation of God and has earned himself the title of judge, the only one who is the true judge. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Assurance is an underwriting, like a guarantee. You know, a guarantee is inviolate. You go back with a faulty product and you say, I'm claiming. God says, I am so guaranteeing you this, and the proof I'm going to give you that you can bank is that I raised Jesus from the dead. That's my proof to you that he is coming back he will be my judge, and he's going to judge according to righteousness and truth in the earth. That's why it matters. And you and I, my dear friends, can be part of that world if we follow Christ now. We're living in this terrible post-truth era as it stands now. There are many half-lies and half-truths. There are many opinions of truth. But there's only one truth that can truly save you. And it's our appeal to you that you each choose truth and choose wisdom. It'll set you free and it'll liberate you in Christ. Make the right choice now. Thank you.
BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.